Right. It's like if you were um, traumatized and manipulated as a child, you'll enjoy <laughs> doing this to other it's, people. Exactly. Distraction makers. So I was listening to uh, a update from Wizards of the Coast about uh, ban and restricted list, and they one of the things that they kept saying was they're trying to uh, incentivize positive play patterns and and remove negative play patterns from the game. Yeah. And it, made, it it got me thinking about like, I don't know if that many people know what that means. You know, like they right. talk about that in the sense that like, oh, look, everybody just knows what a positive and negative play pattern is. It's also super subjective because you can have some players that really, really have a lot of fun playing a negative play pattern. Right. What I thought we should do <laughs> is to, is talk a bit about what we see as positive and negative play patterns and talk through some of the ways that Magic the Gathering has uh incentivized these things um or or these things defined through different play styles in magic the gathering yeah um so i think at the forefront of what we're talking about is interaction yeah in that um games uh especially competitive games are about interacting with your opponent right in magic specifically um the game is built on the need to attack your opponent theoretically uh, attack your opponent with creatures. They can interact with your creatures by blocking them. Uh, creatures are inherently the most interactive type of card in Magic. They have m m uh, the most axes of interaction, uh, including combat. They're the only cards that inter interact, you know, directly in combat um, inherently. So when we look at 60 card, 20 health Magic, um, attacking with creatures is usually the most optimal strategy um and that would would probably be um a good play experience theoretically you have back and forth you have a lot of decisions you have a lot of interaction points um i think those are some of the, th the things that define a positive healthy play environment right um negative interaction a negative ex play experience i think is best uh, exemplified through the Lantern Control deck. <laughs> the infamous Lantern Control. Basically, it, it revolves around um, this card called Lantern of Insight, which makes both players play with the top of their library revealed so that you can see exactly what your opponent is going to draw. And then you play other cards, which makes it so they have to discard the top card of the library. And you can basically ensure that whatever they're going to draw is going to be bad. And this style of like prison deck, right? The it I think can be enjoyable to play, right? There there is an experience to be had there by the player piloting the deck and making those critical decisions about well what what is okay for my opponent to draw, what isn't okay for my opponent to draw. Right. It's like if you were um traumatized and manipulated as a child, you'll enjoy <laughs> doing this to other it's, people exactly yeah. if, if you've had no control in your life <laughs> yeah this is now how you can have that control now you can feel that you can feel powerful <laughs> yeah as you're making everyone else miserable i think that is sort of uh one of the best examples of a control strategy uh that is a miserable play experience that's a negative play pattern we see this play pattern emerge mostly in combo decks though um combo decks like dredge and storm are like particularly bad ones in this sort of play experience and that again they're very non-interactive uh they're just trying to win the game before your opponent can do anything meaningful and one of the one of the things that got me <clears throat> kind of interested in talking about this is that they spoiled that they're going to uh print reprint priest of titania in um modern horizons th uh, three yeah and it made me go well that's such an odd choice like why pick that card you know, it's gonna uh, be good for elves, right? It's yeah. very, very much a, uh, a a card that will be good for an elf deck. Well, there happens to be an elf combo deck that used to be very popular that is not popular anymore called Elf Ball. The way that Elf Ball plays, it is technically a combo deck, but it is also kind of an aggro combo deck in that your combo pieces are creatures. They're on the board. They are inherently interactable, right? They're there on the board. Your opponent can see your build up to winning the game, um, and there, you know, it, that style of play is going to make an opponent feel better about the information that they have, how close you are to winning the game, where are my points of interaction, how do I, like, there's more of a back and forth there. Yeah. Where if you compare this to a combo deck like Storm, Storm is assembling their combo in their hand, right? It's all unknown information. It's pretty difficult to tell, unless you're a very experienced player, how close they are to comboing off. 
And then so- sometimes when you're playing Storm, you don't even know if you have the combo yet, and you just go, and maybe you get there. Right. So that, again, is an interesting play pattern for the person playing it, but not for the person playing against them. So the point, I think, that hinges on whether a play pattern is sort of good or bad or po- good or bad is probably not the right way to describe positive it. Positive or, or negative. Negative. What this comes down to is interaction. Uh, and I know, like, we were just testing a game that you're working on, and this yeah. this came up. Very similar thing kind of came up in that um, players had unknown information, and one one player ended up just sort of, like, winning the game, and everybody else was kind of like, well, I don't know how that happened. It just sort of happened yeah. because there was there wasn't enough information present for the players to really like be able to wrap their head around and se- and and see visually how close somebody was to winning. Right. Uh the way I like to think about these play patterns um is I like to think about like fundamentals of games. And when you look at any game, it's fundamental aspects is that you have an objective and you have an interaction um that I like to refer to a lot of times as a test of skill. And so if uh, your test of skill is defeat my opponent um, or work past what my opponent is setting up to defeat me, um, and uh, that's like the test that your opponent is building for you, especially in a 1v1 game like that, right? The objective, take out your opponent. The problem is that you no longer see what your test of skill is, right? You don't see what your interaction is meant to be right. as a player playing against someone that has a combo deck that's played entirely by hand. Right, and, and it, it, it starts to operate off of these axes that are not the like same way you would track how close you are to winning or losing the game, right? Because yeah. these decks are being designed in a way to just win in one turn. Therefore, it, doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what your health is at right it's yeah. like you 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 have no barometer you have no way to know right how and close I, they are to winning i think that's i think that's the point that i want to make sure is clear is because i think that it could be misconstrued as we're talking about positive negative play patterns or what's good right. and what's bad that i think some players will be like well i really like playing storm or i really like playing uh any other i, I don't know i don't know the decks all right but i know generally how Storm. Long long term. Storm combo. is a good example. We'll say storm. You did right? it. Just Great. just write it out. Act like you knew what you were talking Great. about. I totally know <laughs> how to play storm. But what, like, what card does it play to win the game? You know? uh, tendrils. Yeah, it is. He did it. He did it. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't tell me that just before we started recording. You remembered though. Yeah, I did <laughs> somehow. Um, but like, I think oh, I forgot what my point was. Sorry, show up real bad. Oh man. <laughs> Uh, what were we saying just before that? Some players like to play Storm. Yes. Okay. So some some players like to play those types of combo decks. Yeah. Um, I don't know many players that like to play against those types of combo decks, right? And uh, I I should say, uh, like, I'll I'll just interject with uh, newer players. Newer I, players. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I think that as you get more experienced in the game, you start to see nuances. You start to you know, I talked about in uh, maybe it was our heuristics video or something that like as I've been playing more, I'm looking less at the board and I'm looking more at mana and my and yep. the player's hand. You start to notice these points <laughs> where you can glean information about where your opponent is that right. you never would have picked up on previously. And I think yeah. that that's interesting once you get to that point. Yeah. But as a new player, that sucks. It's yep. terrible. And it's not that I mean, magic has, you know, hit its level of uh, success because it can be interesting to new players but also offer this high level of mastery that players that maybe want to play a storm deck or play like these you know more uh, harder to glean uh, information off of each other uh, like that's sort of a play pattern and they could enjoy that right i talked about like you and i played like uh i played mono blue and you you played uh, deck that primarily had blue i think and or you did have blue at least and we played a 1v1 um and that was like one of my favorite matches uh because it was the first time i actually was really i hadn't gotten into standard yet i was still in commander land and uh that was the first time i was like oh i'm like getting it like i get like <laughs> i can we, see the matrix we, we both definitely have a gun in our hand. <laughs> And we don't know who's going to start blasting first. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, like, I think it's really fun. And that's, right. I think, more of a high-level experience when yep. you start playing the game a lot more. 
Well, and it's it, it, it's one of the reasons why newer players really dislike counter spells. It's this this not being able to like there's too many other things to think about for them to to sort of store that away to start thinking about the next layers of the game. Yeah. And so when a counter spell interrupts them, it feels super unfair. Like yeah. how am I supposed to know that they could have had that or that they could do that? Yeah. How am I supposed to know? All the clues are there, right? But you're not at the point like the the rest of the structure learning the rest of the structure of the game is com- so complex that you're not able to even see that stuff yet. Yeah. So one thing that I want to bring up here is that um commander as a format um because life totals are so high uh when you start to get to the upper like levels of the format <clears throat> it starts to incentivize winning the game through other means besides attacking. Mm-hmm. Um which like basically creates what we're talking about. It creates this play experience where your your best way to win the game is through assembling the means to beat everybody all at once in your hand so right. that other people don't know how close you are to winning the game and then you just sort of like go off and try to win the game and fight your way through everybody else's counter magic. And it, it's weird because in the casual state of the format, attacking and winning the game feels viable it's like okay well everybody has you know a lot of health but that means that the game can go long enough that if i get ganged up on i I won't just die right away yeah um but what effectively what ends up happening is because life totals are so high it's just not uh uh, the 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 cards that you're playing with are designed to beat someone with 20 health not uh, three other people with 40 health so it becomes fairly unlikely that you're going to be able to efficiently win the game through attacking with creatures, which yeah. then incentivizes these other ways of interacting and other ways of winning the game. Right. Um, and that is probably a pretty problematic situation to be in. Right? right. I think it's, it's interesting because I think, I think there's going to be, this is going to be one of those times that I think we're going to have a bit of a separation between player experience and designer experience. Yeah, that's a good point. Where I think players are going to hear us talking about this and they're going to say, well, I like playing like that or players can play however they want to play. And all that is absolutely true. But I'd say like most designers that are working on a game are probably going to look at that and be like, we don't want that as like a way right. that you can win. Right. We're talking <laughs> like, <laughs> more about like, obviously we're talking from like a design perspective here of like what your rules and structures of your game are incentivizing. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's the, the, the territory exactly like what you're talking about. Where as a player, you're going to be like, you might be, I like playing these types of strategies. And so I think as a designer, the thing that you need to do is keep that in mind and figure out how you can, let people play in similar ways, but have it be a positive experience rather than a negative one. Right. So this brings back around to, um, is there a way to turn lantern lantern control into a positive experience? And I think the way to do that is, okay, well, what what is interesting about this scenario? It's about how, how good each individual card is in this moment. Yeah. So if you're able to do that to your own deck and not your opponent's deck, that would be a much more positive play experience as long mm. as what you're doing is still interactive, interacting with your opponent. I just think that you need to have some points of interaction that your right. opponent has um, not completely unknown information of what your plan is. Right. And I think as long as you can fulfill those things, then it's probably going to be generally a more positive experience for both players. Right. Well, and I think that the thing that you really hit on here is that the systems of the game should incentivize interaction. Yeah. Where... Mm. The way that you win a game of magic, theoretically, most of the time, is dealing 20 damage to your opponent. And you have to do that through their creatures to get to their health. So you have to interact with the cards that you're that they're playing inherently. Um, and when you have a game that makes that either uh, un- unfeasible or makes it not even required, you're going to end up in this territory where it's going to feel like we're both playing solitaire and every once in a while we interact with each other. And that's, you know, it, it, there's a debate here, right? Because if you're in an, a multiplayer environment, like the the games of, of Commander end up sort of feeling like this sometimes where like everybody's kind of just doing their thing and then you're interacting kind of when you have to. Right. And like that can be a more relaxing play experience for sure. But I think the part that you need to be wary of and careful of is moving into that oops, I win territory, Yeah, which is I'm able to assemble everything I need to win and then I just win and nobody can see that I'm doing that Yeah, to to know when they need to interact with me. In fact, 